I like it when we start a show, a really live show on Pro Cannabis Media on a Friday afternoon, and I know that my director, Dan French, is smiling going into the production. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Green Rush Live, our regularly scheduled cannabis business talk show that we do every Friday afternoon here on the Pro Cannabis Media Network. I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media. Always happy to have my pal Josh Kincaid, as we go co coast to coast, he's in Washington State, and I'm on the East Coast of uh, in Massachusetts, and we're so happy to bring on a guy that I think a lot of people, anybody in the industry who doesn't know who George Jage is, is shouldn't be allowed in the industry. He's the founder of MJ BizCon and MJ Unpacked. George, thank you so much for joining us here today. Well, that's that's very humbling introduction, Jimmy. It's always great to see you and Josh. Um, I was not the founder of MJ BizCon. Um, I took over when it was MMJ Business Daily, and they did a trade show at a racetrack and did run it for a couple of years. But uh, you know, that, people get confused because uh, I was the face of the the company and built it up. But thank you. And by the way, that's the second time I've done that same thing because it's assumed. It's 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 one of those like. Uh, in, in law, they have de facto, and then they have, you know, the reality. And the reality is, George, you took it to a whole new level. That's another story. All right. I appreciate it. And I appreciate your humbleness and, and everything. Let's talk about MJ Unpacked in New York uh, coming up in a few weeks. And how excited are you? Oh, man. Uh, uh, super excited. You know, I mean, building a trade show and, and creating an event, and, and it's really about, you know, creating a community. You know, it takes a little bit of time. I mean, it was really only about 18 months ago that we launched our first event. And um, everybody was texting me from Benzinga that uh, everybody's saying that the three most important shows in the industry are MJ Biz, MJ Impact, and Benzinga now, and have really kind of separated themselves, I think, from a lot of the smaller shows that are, are kind of servicing, you know, these state markets, um, you know, or going into early stage markets. Uh, but, you know, I, again, like, like super excited, like you kind of have these catch fire moments, like when you finally convince people like, hey, we've created something really exceptional here and this is worth your time. Um, and win those, you know, kind of minds and hearts over and everything else. And and it takes time. And, and you know, we've got a great team of people. Um, obviously, you know, Wendy from my team, you know, my wife, Kim, Morgan, Spencer, that work are working their asses off every day to make sure that this is the best one yet. Um, the timing, I think, couldn't be better. It's an event that obviously, you know, we curate the audience so that it's executive level decision makers that are licensed operators. So it's not a bunch of people looking for a job or kicking tires. And we also let accredited investors in. Um, but the time, you know, so it's the right show. It's the right place. It's the right audience, the right people in the room. Um, and uh, we couldn't be more excited. But thanks for asking, Jim. Is the Bang Gong going to be there? Uh, well, we actually uh, took over more space at the New York Hilton. So the exhibit halls are in the what they call the America's Hall. And there's two floors kind of mirrored on top of each other. So we actually have two gongs this year. Oh, two gongs. Oh, my two God. Gongs. So there'll be a gong on each floor. The gong's going to definitely be going. Um, you know, we always try to throw some kind of unique things in there to kind of, you know, create a little bit of entertainment value. Um, got a few other tricks up my sleeve, but we'll let the attendees see it when they get to show site. There you go. Josh, I know you got a bunch of questions. I'm going to let you uh, take over for a few minutes here as I try to fight the nausea that I'm fighting right now. And and that's not yeah, because okay. that's not because either of one of you. I just don't feel well today. So go ahead. <laughs> Cannabis is good for that, Jimmy. Yeah, I, I, yeah. at four thirty. <laughs> <laughs> that's ahead, that's actually where where uh, where Jimmy and I met was was there. So uh, out in Vegas, right? Um, your first one, which kind of ties that all together because it is one of those shows that will kind of um, seems to to want to live for a lot longer than some of the other ones. Canacon, for example, based in Seattle, not really relevant outside of Oklahoma. It seems like um, what we noticed early on with Canacon was a pay to play system at the speaker level. You don't really see that too much at the successful level. So the top three shows you mentioned are about value. Yeah. And I think you've, you've been able to do that, George, is offer value. It's kind of like that Gary V jab, jab, right hook. It just comes naturally if you if you provide value. There's a lot of things that started in Seattle that are no longer here that I wish were, um, but they were more about how do I make money? And it's like, yeah. no, you, you have to offer value first, and then the money should follow. And if you're only looking at money, you're not going to be around very long. And that that equation, unfortunately, is played out way too often. And that, I believe, is your secret sauce and why the three of you being Ben Zing, MJ Impact, and uh, MJ BizCon are leading the pack and kind of differentiating yourself. 
Yeah, and and listen, I you know I'm not here to kind of put people down or anything else, and 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 you know I think each event kind of has their own kind of unique flair and, and everything else. But yes, I mean you know this is something that I am very critical of other events that they're just in it to sell a booth and sell a ticket. I they I, I say that they're in the real estate business trying to sell 100 square feet at a time, you know not really care. And I mean you know I built MJ BizCon and I, you know I was hoping to you know take that to a different level at one point, but you know we parted ways. But I mean, you know, that show is that way. I, I mean, you know, they just care. Like they had 125 packaging companies at the show. Show. I mean, I highly, highly doubt that there was anybody in that organization that took the time to really assess. You know, is there enough buying power coming in, looking for packaging buyers that are coming to our show that would be able to create a good return on investment for them? And so, you know, we did kind of, you know, look at all the events out there. And I'm gonna be honest. Like we said, what sucks and what can we do different that would really resonate with people? We mail people's badges if they register early so they don't have to wait in line. I hate waiting in line. Jimmy hates waiting in line. Josh, you hate waiting in line. Um, you know, our sales team doesn't ever say, hey, do you want to buy a booth? They say, what are your goals? What's your objectives? Like, I need to understand it because I don't want to sell you a booth and then not be able to sell you another booth. It takes a long time to build a relationship in any industry and certainly in cannabis. So we want to be able to maintain those relationships that we have delivered them value. And my wife and I, the founder of the company, I mean, we've, you know, built other trade shows before. It's always got to be customer value first. Like if you can't, if you create that value, you're going to create a very successful business and it can never be the other way around. If you go in it saying, how can I just, you know, get them to pay money? I mean, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody in the, specifically in the cannabis industry, but you know, I've seen all the tricks. I've been in the trade show industry for 30 years. You know, people will go out and, you know, give free boosts and speaking spots to these companies to make it seem like they have all the star players at their event, but none of them actually buy in because they're not paying for it. And Sometimes they don't even show up. Um, it was years ago that the, the, there was an event out in California that had promoted Whoopi Goldberg was going to be speaking when she had her Whoopi in my line, and they actually never had her under contract. Um, I know because Whoopi was $150,000 that included buying out a full full uh, uh, airplane for her to fly on because she doesn't like traveling with other people. So, um, you know, it's it, it's important to understand what are the needs of the market at the moment. And, and you know, we approach, you know, creating a trade event as a hospitality event and as a community event. And so, you know, we want this to live beyond that. And we're in the connection business. We're not in the real estate business. Like you guys connecting at our show, you know, makes me ex exceptionally happy because like, look at this, you guys are, you guys are collabing. You guys got this going on. Um, you know, it's amazing to see how those kind of like the butterfly flapping its wings, you know, creates a tornado down the road. You know, you never know how those connections are going to flourish. And when we designed the event too, it was like, you know, you're not going to build a relationship walking down an aisle, but if we have a lot of soft seating and you feel like you can sit down and have a conversation with somebody and get to know them, build trust, you build a relationship, then you do business together. And yeah. it, it, you can't do it if you, if you, you know, online and, virtual events or, you know, walking down an aisle and grabbing a squishy ball on a business card. Yeah. Hey, I, I do want to mention uh, another trade show that is near and dear to my heart because it's in my region of New England and it's yeah. sneak in. Mark Shepard's done an amazing job over the Mark years. Mark is a great, great organizer. I have a lot of respect for Mark. He and I are, are good friends. We talk often and, and, you know, chat shop and, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, he's really built a, a, a big event. I mean, he's, like uh, like like ourselves we've gone out and done events that you know maybe haven't been as as great as we want mark you know has that new knee can in new england it's i mean it is the the event for the new england market period hands down nobody can touch him um he's gone out to like reno years ago and and tried to do stuff in these other markets uh to kind of expand his business and i know that's tough um because you got to start you're really building another show kind of like if you have a brand in in washington and you want to go open one up in oregon you got to start from the bottom and build that tower up Absolutely. Go ahead, Josh. I know you got something. I gave him something else. <laughs> uh, wait, wait, I was going to just rip on uh, on the whole business uh, and networking and everything, because I think that's also kind of what set, separates some people. Uh, MJ BizCon, they, they have the high times party and there's a lot of people, uh, especially, you know, just after the last MJ BizCon, where uh, a lot of people were putting out surveys asking, why do you go? And the majority of people are like, I go for the parties. Mm -hmm. So you're getting a totally different crowd than you would see at MJ Unpacked. Who, but that you know, goes back to the value comment you brought up before, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. So you got to understand like the the economics too of the industry and the psychology of the industry. 
So all of the supply chain purchasing decisions start at the apex of the ladder, which is the cultivators, the brands, and the retailers. Any, any of those companies that are exhibiting at the supply side shows like MJ BizCon need to have those people who are going to control the money being spent down into the ecosystem to create returns on investment. They lost control of their event in 2018. The parties, the suites, the private dinners became way more important. So that the key decision makers go out to Vegas for MJ Biz, but they don't really go to the show anymore. And that's that's you know creating a, a you know a decreasing return on investment for a lot of the companies that spend money with them, and they keep raising their prices. Yeah, well, they're in a business. And and speaking of business, um, when you when I get out and I actually talk to people, interview people on this show, other shows. Um, I always hear the same thing. People who know, there are people in the cannabis industry who know cannabis, and there are people in the cannabis industry that know business, but that cannabis business person is evolving. Now, George, yes. you are one. I can tell you that. You're definitely one. How do you see the actual business? Because, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there right now in the industry. Yeah. Um, well, you know, for, fortunately or unfortunately, I've had experience going through this before. I mean, you know, as far as me having that, you know, cannabis business experience, I mean, you know, that was when, you know, pretty much from when I was like 15 to like 21, where I had my herbal distribution business, right? Um, but, um, you know, I mean, it is important. I do see that kind of meritage where you need to bring together some people that understand it's, it's, it's not just the plant, you need to understand the science of the plant, but the culture of the community, right? And who are the customers and, and why are people choosing this, this, this as a lifestyle choice or as a medical choice? Um, and you do need somebody that knows how to run the business too, and you know keep the lights on. So it, it is important. I mean, it can be two different people that come together. Um, I run a business with my wife. Um, there's a great book called um, oh, what was it? Actually, I just finished it up. It's called Rocket Fuel, and it talks about you know how you need to have. You don't want to marry somebody like yourself, and you don't want to go into business like somebody yourself. You're gonna, you're gonna be looking in the mirror, and you're gonna be in an echo chamber every day, right? So you need to have kind of, you know, multiple mindsets and perspectives to create successful enterprise. Um, you know, absolutely. And um, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, no, no, it, it answers it because we're in the middle of it. You, you, There's not going to be a day that we all wake up and it's the cannabis industry is going to be accepted. I don't care if it's you know, legalization involves lawyers and politicians. That's just not going to happen for a long time because, well, we know why. Let's not get into that. But it's normalization. It's like, hey, this industry is here now. They're making billions of dollars. People are in it, even though it's all cash. And even though every single thing- Double-digit kegger every year. It's double-digit growth for our industry. And part of it is new markets coming online. I mean, you know, think of the growth that uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut- right. Um, Maryland, all these states that are, you know, moving to adult use, are, are, what, what impacts that can have? Um, right. You know, um, it, it, it is a fast growth industry. But, you know, I just had this conversation with an, a, an old friend, actually. Um, I'm just going to share a little story here about Cooks. It's important and personal to me. Um, there's a guy in the trade show industry named Peter Nathan, and he was like the godfather of the trade show industry. He's been doing it for like 50 years. He did the first ever trade show in Libya, in Cuba. Um, he's a legend and he just passed away about a month ago and he was always just, you know, kind of like a very much of a business father figure to me. Um, I just talked to his daughter last night and I was kind of, she's thinking about getting back into the event space, maybe even the cannabis event space. And she, I explained to her, like, there's such a lack of access to capital in the industry. And she goes, I'm so surprised. I'm so surprised. Like everybody's so excited about cannabis. It's growing all the time. Like, why is there this lack of access to capital? Right. And and it really is a, a complete and abject failure of government um, that they have, you know, that we don't have access to safe banking, which creates a, a bullshit, you know, perceived risk on these businesses. It's actually a public safety issue. People get shot here in Washington, Josh, as you know, um, working a $15 an hour retail job. I mean, get the fuck out of our way. Pardon my French, but, you know, and hopefully this is a R-rated show. Um, yeah, you know, but get the fuck out of our way and, and just get safe banking across the transom. Don't attach it to 20 other, you know, social equity, um, you know, provisions, expungement. Let's just get the safe banking because it is a critical, you know, it's going to save lives, period, right? Um, create some efficiency in the in, in the in the ecosystem. But it's gonna also, you know, increase the opportunity for investor confidence. And you'll see, you know, major US exchanges moving to start, you know. 
um, you know, listing, maybe it's the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ, but they're never going to do it if there's no safe banking. Um, and we need institutional capital. We need private equity. Um, we need the angel investors to see that we're just about to get there. So they start opening up their, uh, you know, wallets and purse strings. And, um, you know, the venture funds, I, I don't know, they might have run their course in this industry because they made a lot of place bets early on. You know, very few of them have had round trips, you know, uh, for their investors. So they're very, you know, strained to be able to raise more money. If they have any money, they're saving it to, you know, support companies they've already invested in so that they don't go to zero. Um, we're seeing it all over the place. And it's just, listen, we might see a couple MSOs, you know, fail on their debt, um, you know, default on their debt, and they're going to go down. Now, that doesn't mean that the industry is not healthy. It doesn't mean the industry is not growing. Um, it might mean that something was mismanaged or over leveraged. And when something's over leveraged and the interest rates go up and capital dries up, you get yourself in a little bit of trouble. So um, anyway, sorry for the rant. I just, oh. I, I just, I, I'm beside myself that we don't have, you know, the industry leadership or, you know, the government leadership to solve a very, very, very simple problem. Yeah, I, but doesn't I, that also provide some opportunities? Because there's a, a report out from uh, Viridian Capital, right? So they yeah. came out and said that the capital raises dropped from 12 billion in 2021 to 4 billion in 2022. And so I'm thinking that with the lack of capital, that actually might create more opportunities for, uh, you know, just m as mergers so that you know you might have two zombies like hexo and tilray holding each other up and it's just a matter of time before they they finally fall into their grave but at least it does provide an opportunity to maybe breathe and live another day yeah and i think it, like you know this type of like economic contraction i mean this is just how capital markets work and 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 marketplaces work there's going to be expansion and contraction you know agriculture is going to have droughts and the price of bananas are going to go up um you know from time to time um, you know, this is, you know, a lot of people have been saying like, this is like the dot-com bubble bursting in, in the late nineties. And it does, it, it, it will eliminate, you know, poorly managed, poorly capitalized companies, um, companies that don't deliver value, um, are going to probably really struggle. And I think that it also does create, you know, kind of a pathway and a demand for collaborative work like you guys are doing, right. Um, you know, media is tough, um, you know, events. <laughs> publishing, podcasting, there's a lot of media content out there and there's not a lot of advertisers. Um, so, you know, you need to be, you know, best of class and you'll survive and probably thrive. But if you're, you know, just kind of doing the same old, same old and not innovating or collaborating or partnering or finding a way that one plus one can equal 11, um, I think it's going to be a tough road and we're probably six to 12 months before things start really turning. Mm. That's actually great advice. Believe me, great insight on that. Now I got, I got a question for you. And actually Josh and I worked on this one together. Okay. And if you had to pick one of the big three conglomerate industries that are out there, you've got your alcohol, your pharma, and your big tobacco, which one do you think will end up uh, either operating in the cannabis space or will it be a combination of all three? W what's your feeling about that? Well, you know, I, I, listen, I'm not on the front lines of a lot of, you know, what's happening on, on what is it, D Street or J Street with all the lobbyists in, in Washington. But, um, you know, you have to believe that, um, you know, it's in their advantage to have the industry um, strained and desperate so that when they can move into the space on a federal legalization, it's, you know, instead of paying 10 bucks for something, they're paying five. Um, you know, I think that that pharma's got got a pathway. I mean, um, in this space, in, in and you know, my mother in law worked for Johnson and Johnson for decades, and so she lives out in Jersey and kind of that pharma kind of corridor out there. Um, you know, pharmaceuticals tend to want to extract the intelligence and leave the wisdom. Um, and so we find something that might be of medical benefit or value, and we want to isolated and we want to get it into a pill form and then we want to make it so it, that it's not somebody else can copy it. I mean, this is medicine that is available that we can grow in our backyard. Uh, I'm not pointing to my backyard. There are no marijuana plants in my backyard, officer. All right. So um, the, you know, but, but and tobacco, I mean, listen, they've got the technology stacks, they've got the plans. And I think tobacco is probably going to be a stronger 
force coming to this industry for the sake that I think they're the weakest, um, they're, they're most susceptible to, you know, continuing uh, having challenges of, of finding and addicting new customers. <laughs> um, and the alcohol industry, you know, I'm good friends back in my home state of Wisconsin. Yeah, you know, you betcha that, you know, they're selling, they're selling Delta eight beverages all day long at their bar. And they're like, we're never going to get legal weed here because the tavern league is so strong. And we know that, that alcohol sales go down, you know, as soon as the legalization happens. So, you know, it's just, again, it's opposing forces. It's kind of like, you know, the, the privatizing prisons, again, one of the probably the worst ideas ever, but you know, there's a lot of lobbyists that, you know, uh, corporate lobbyists that can influence that to privatize prisons. And, you know, I think history will look back as that being one of the stupidest things that we've ever done, not to mention how over incarcerated our country is, but without going off on too much of a rabbit hole, I, I think that alcohol is probably best positioned. I think that uh, tobacco is probably most motivated. And I think pharma is um, going to kind of take a little bit of a different path and probably try to fuck up something that nature made perfect to begin with. <laughs> that That's a great quote, by the way, George. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. All right. You caught me uh, on a Friday. It's been a long week. I'm just going to let it hang out today, Jimmy. No, I love that. And I appreciate you. I know you've moved some things around so we could hang out and talk for a little bit because I've always enjoyed uh, our chats uh, over the last few years. You used the word uh, collaboration. And it is a word that this industry still struggles with. There is a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot of bullying going on in this industry. I'm talking basically in the Massachusetts area, just because these are the stories that I hear a lot of. Yes, there's some MSOs involved with that. But the, my, my point is, how is the industry going to survive if we get childish with our philosophies and we start to backbite and, and, and bully others that are in it for the reason that you just said, this is a medicine. You want to help people. There are a lot of people out there in this industry who just want to help people feel better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, listen, uh, and Josh, you've been around a long time. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of backstabbing and, and, you know, ankle biting that goes on in the industry. Um, you know, some people like MSOs are, are the devil. Um, you know, they're not. Um, and, and I saw a really interesting po post. It's like, you know, like they're saying they're complaining about the MSOs having too much power or, or money. And, and like, somebody quoted said like, what are you going to do when InBev comes in, right? They're going to, you know, they're going to be, you know, 20, 30 X, you know, more powerful than any MSO that exists today. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it, listen, I mean, maybe we all just need to have a group therapy session and smoke some weed and talk about how we're going to get along better. Exactly. Um, you know, I mean, it kind of has that effect on people, right? Like you go out and get drunk, you want to fight. And when you smoke a joint, you want to love. Right. Um, so this is why this is why it can be so transformational for society, right? Like, I mean, we're going to reduce some of the physiological harm that alcohol causes on the body. Uh, we can reduce some of the societal harm that violence that that stems from, uh, you know, overuse or overconsumption of alcohol causes, um, you know, deaths. I mean, I, I'm not encouraging anybody to drive stone, but, you know, I mean, drunk drivers are probably more impaired than a cannabis driver who might be driving a little too slow where the uh, you know alcohol is going to make want to drive too fast still bad idea to drink and under and, or drive under the influence of anything i just want to make that clear huh. but um you know hopefully we can see some some reduction damage and, and jimmy and, and josh i mean you we're focused on the cannabis industry i mean when you look at the restorative power of hemp and the way that it could absolutely radically transform so many major industries that are the primary contributors to our you know, global extinction threat called climate change. Um, you know, we can use hemp to restore soil that's been, you know, toxified. We can use it to, you know, it's a natural, easy growing plant that can be used for fuel. It can be used for textiles. It can be used to create bioplastics that truly biodegrade. Um, man, I, I just, I wish we could get the capital behind that and people would see, you know, Maybe like an Exxon Mobil after they made, you know, $62 billion in profit last quarter could invest into something around the hemp space. Yeah. Well, hemp needs a better marketing agent like uh, ChatGPT or AI is getting right now. And it would do a lot better. Yeah. yeah. 
Hey, George, I just so appreciate, I know that Josh and I and you, we could talk for an, at least an hour, but I really, as much as I'd love to do that, I'm not sure I'm going to make it much past the next few minutes. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to tease what's happening over the next hour and a half on the show. Brandon Jones, our correspondent from Missouri, has a bunch of interviews that he's done this week. Missouri's market is just exploding, and he's going to take over the rest of the show. And of course, following this show, is our weekly We Talk News show. So, uh, George, best of luck at MJ Unpacked. Josh, thanks for being there and being my crutch today. I really appreciate <laughs> it. I know people have heard, he doesn't look sick. I'm pretty nauseous right now. That being said, no uh, everybody, no ha have a great weekend, everybody. And uh, we definitely will be have a very special 421 show next week. And we'll get into that if you tune in. So, uh, again, thanks for watching the really live part of the Green Rush Live. And from here on in, we're live streaming, but it is recorded content. We'll see you next time. Jimmy, Josh, thank you guys so much. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out. And check out these other videos that we've got.